century than evangelist Sherry Brogdon. Glory to God. Saved under the legendary Bishop Morris Ellis Golder. Yes, sir. And they called Bishop the Prince of Preachers. The Prince of Preachers. You can listen to an audio of Bishop Golder preaching in the 50s and 60s. And right now, it sounds like he's preaching in 2022. She was saved under his ministry. Then she worked directly with my father, the Honorable Bishop James Edison Tyson. She worked directly with the early great Bishop Wayne Davis of Inglewood, California. And we all know that she worked directly with our leader and our bishop, the Honorable Bishop Norman L. Wagner. Evangelist Brogdon, I'd like to begin today's class by asking you, and you'll probably have to come and share on this mic so the internet audience can hear your response. I'd like for you to share with us one trait of each four of those great leaders, just one trait of the four that made them great. Bishop Morris Ellis Golder, Bishop James E. Tyson, Bishop Wayne Davis, and Bishop Norman Wagner. One trait that made them great. Let's receive Evangelist Brogdon. Amen. Let's receive the great Evangelist Sherry Brogdon. By saying amen. To the household of faith, I say praise the Lord. I thank God for the great Honorable C. Sean Tyson who so much like his father doesn't mind calling you out of nowhere to do anything. Um, it, it has been my privilege to be able to work with these men of God and their wives and families. Uh, it was my privilege. Um, I was saved uh, at Grace Apostolic Church, Grace Apostolic Church in Indianapolis um, when I was 11 years old. And Bishop Morris E. Golder was an extraordinary teacher. Um, he was one who took great time in breaking down the word of God. So if I were to extol a virtue of Bishop Golder, it would be his ability to teach and his desire that we be taught of the word of God. Um, Bishop James E. Tyson um, became my pastor when I was 21 years old. Um, I had my daughter and the boys had not been born, Josh and Brad. They grew up in Christ Church. Um, Bishop Tyson drove into me the love of the people of God. Bishop loved God's people. He would spend endless amount of times talking, time talking to people. And not only that, I remember specifically, we had a old beat up a van and we were driving it to church. And apparently Bishop had been watching us driving this van and I remember him coming to my children's father and asking, are you putting oil in that van? The only way it's going to run good, brother, if you take care of the engine. Now, what kind of pastor is listening to the sound of your vehicle, watching your children, so the love of God's people, I think, is one of the greatest attributes um, that I learned and, and that I had the, the pleasure of having downloaded into me under Bishop James E. Tyson. Then the Honorable Bishop Wayne Sylvester Davis. Lord, have mercy. Um, it was my first time working in a church in a corporate capacity. You know, it's a different thing from volunteering and just coming in versus actually working at the church. 
Bishop Davis believed if he said you were to be there at 8 o'clock, you came in at 7.50. You were in your office and you were prepared. He taught me promptness and details. He was not one that left one stone unturned. I can remember him going into the sanctuary and if the carpet didn't have the right stripes in it, he would cause the janitor to repeat vacuuming that entire sanctuary. And I would like, Bishop, but it's clean. He said, not for the Lord. Everything must be in order and perfect for the Lord. So if anything that I would take from Bishop Wayne Davis would be his meticulous way of presenting things for the Lord Jesus Christ. The house of God. The vessels that we use. The preparations of ourselves before the Lord. And then the Honorable Bishop Norman L. Wagner. Bishop Wagner knew how to take what looked like an old rock or an old piece of coal and let the Holy Spirit blow off, clean off, and the next thing you know, it was a sparkling diamond. Yes. And you were saying, where did that rock or that coal, how did that transformation take place? And then because he was a man of destiny, he was a man whom God had downloaded the ability to see something in nothing. What would I say as uh, attribute for Bishop Wagner? It was his loyalty to God. No matter who, no matter what, he would be loyal to God and thusly loyal to the people of God. You left out one. Come on now, that's what I was getting ready for. And that's Pastor C. Sean Tyson. I, I, it, it, it's, it's impossible to talk about all of them and not talk about this one. It's not because I've known him since he was a young boy. It's not because I watched him go through the challenges of growing up as a teenager, going through the struggles of being in a blended family, going through the struggles of having older siblings who were doing great things and, and now he's struggling with the loss of his mother and his placement. It's because I saw in him a love for God that caused everything else to become small and the love for God to become bigger. If there was ever an attribute that I could say about this man of God, it is his pursuit of the mind and the love of God. So I'm, I'm privileged. I, I know I'm, I'm privileged and I'm honored to be able to serve with these great men of God. Can we say amen? amen? That was a Bible class unto itself. So we're going to call that part one of today's lesson. John chapter 14 and verse number 12. Accepting the responsibility to be great. If you haven't done so already, I'm going to ask you to share this Bible study with all of your social media friends. Hit those like buttons, share, comment. Subscribe and stay connected with us here at Calvary. Accepting the responsibility to be great. John chapter 14 and verse number 12. Now we want you to read along with us at home as we read aloud here at the church. John 14 and 12. Everyone reading please. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, 
because I go. The Holy Spirit challenged us on Sunday and presented unto us a challenge that is achievable for each and every one of us who believe God's word. I would not describe being great as easy because if it was, everyone would be great. But I will say that being great is doable because we can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth us. I'd like for you to type these words in the comment section where you're watching and I want everyone in the room to say out loud, I can do it. With more confidence, with a more affirming tone, with something in your purview that God has placed in your spirit to do, it's there. Hallelujah. But you have not yet accomplished it, but you know it to be God's will for your life. I want you to say it with more confidence. I can do it. The world is in desperate need for every child of God to be the best version of ourselves. There has come to be what I would describe as an unrighteous resolve. An unrighteous resolve regarding the condition of our city, the condition of our nation, the condition of the world, and that unrighteous resolve, elder, is thinking this is just the way things are. This is just the way they're going to be. And there's not much we can do about it. Well, I want to say to those who have come to that place of unrighteous resolve, that is not a biblical perspective on the power of the influence of a saint of God who is committed to the pursuit of personal greatness and your capacity to create positive change. Everyone at home type these words in the comment section, I am a difference maker. Well, I appreciate you saying that. That must have just been in your spirit. I didn't even ask for it. But that's just a sign it's in your spirit because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Well, we might as well do it all together, everyone. I am a difference maker. Yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. Seal that in the saint that's nearest you and look at them and tell them you are a difference maker. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 19. Romans 8 and 19. I am a difference maker. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 19. I would submit to you that a very great deal of the reason you have experienced the challenges that you have experienced and are experiencing is because the enemy knows the difference that you make. Thank you, Jesus. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 19. If you have it, can you say amen? amen. Thank you, saints. We're reading aloud here in the class and at home. 819 Romans. Let's read. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Lay your hands on yourself and say the moment, the moment. is waiting for me. Again, the moment is waiting for me. Waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Drop down to verse number 22. Let us read. For we know, everyone, that the whole creation
The whole creation grown it. Nephew, get me a, a little water if you don't mind, son. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. How? Come on. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. How? Together. Together. We that are in the church must not be under the delusion that what's happening out there in them streets does not affect us here in the church. We are all affected. The whole creation travaileth in pain together. Watch this, saints. Much of the spiritual and moral darkness that is permeating our society and culture is not the direct fault of the devil. It's the plan of the devil, but it's not the direct fault of the devil. Watch it now. It is the indirect result of the failure of the lights of the world and the salt of the earth to operate in the fullness of God's power and the fulfillment of our purpose, which, Minister Sadie, would not totally, it would not totally negate the works of the devil, but it would neutralize them yes, sir. Yes. to a much greater degree where more men, women, children could come into the fulfillment of their purpose because the manifestation of the sons of God would be a fence around them until they came to the recognition of who they are. Yay! Hallelujah! Jesus, help us. We must be great. I want to submit this principle to you, class. Saints. Deacon Foster, here's where I'm at. It is unacceptable. Let the church say unacceptable. unacceptable. It is unacceptable for the children of darkness to be great at what they do and the people of God be average at what they do. It's unacceptable. And according to the teachings of Jesus, that is in many cases the reality. For the children of darkness in their generation are wiser than the children of light. Yes, Father. I wrote that scripture out and I put a circle around it and I drew a line through it because I don't want that to be true with me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's what I did. So I, I got what you're saying, but in many cases it can be like that. Jesus put it out there so that we could realize that and for you to teach that, that we don't have to be. Wow. God is a wonder. Yes, he is. See, see. Dad, I, I, when you raised your hand, I said, yes, ma'am. It's not because I think you look anything like a woman. That I'm going to leave that to Mother Smith. Thank you, I said, yes, ma'am, because Evangelist Brogdon was standing here, and that got in the front of my mind. I didn't want you to think that I thought you looked like. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. Okay. It is unacceptable for the children of darkness to be great at what they do, and the people of God be average at what they do. For many people, Mother, being average seems inevitable. When we witness the extraordinary accomplishments and feats of uh, Olympic athletes, when we interact, and we've all done it, 
with exceptionally bright people and sharp, quick on their feet. And I've had feelings at times of, whew, I'll never be that smart. I'll never be able to comprehend things uh, the way that person does. It's easy to believe that those individuals have some innate talent that we don't have. That they are special and we are not. Once we embrace that mindset, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It causes you to quit before you ever begin. Joyce Meyer said something some years ago that was a revolutionary revelation for me. She said, you will never be anything more than what you say about yourself. Hallelujah. That changed my life. Thank you, Jesus. you will never be anything more than what you say about yourself. If you are going to accept the responsibility to be great, and I hope you will, then you must decide today that you will cease and desist from all self-defeating thinking and speaking. You got to make that choice today. I told the Lord in prayer this morning that I will never insult God again by saying I cannot do something that God said I can do. There's so much greatness in this room right now. It has every principality and power that is assigned to Youngstown literally trembling. Saying, I hope that they will not believe he's talking about them. I will never insult God again by saying I cannot do something that God said I can do. I'm probably not the only one, Sister Martin, but many of us have talked ourselves out of doing many things that God said we could do. Am I the only one? Fortunately, my assignment today is to let you know it doesn't have to be that way. We all can excel. We can all do great things. Dr. King said, everyone can be great because anyone can serve. So then, how is greatness according to the scriptures achieved? I talked about that Sunday more from a spiritual platform. And today I want to come at this more from a practical perspective. We must begin by understanding that achieving greatness has very little to do with natural giftedness. Bag Bogdan, you, you, we've all heard uh, other preachers when talking about other ministers say, oh, he's a gifted preacher. Or she's a gifted orator. Well, perhaps there's no denying that truth, but some of the most gifted people I have ever met in my life are also some of the most unproductive people I know. Because they have lived their entire life under the false illusion because they were gifted, they didn't have to work to get it. I want to say to all of our gifted young people, gifted college students, gifted entrepreneurs, gifted musicians, gifted singers, those of you that are gifted by God to train, to teach, to 
put things together to raise households, to raise children. You're gifted. Let me say this to you. Being gifted will get you in the room with great people. But it's what you do when you get in the room that will determine whether or not they allow you to stay. Because great thinking people will pick up on lazy in the first five minutes. I, I, what's the name of the gentleman uh, over at Greenwood Chevrolet? He's been a friend of the church. He, Greg Greenwood, Mr. Greg Greenwood. He's been a blessing to Calvary down through the years. Supported the Sons of Thunder. He purchased that big, beautiful scoreboard that's in the gymnasium. I was over there talking to Mr. Greenwood uh, one day about some business. And I didn't have a watch on. And we were talking and so forth. And he, he looked at my wrist and he said, well, Reverend Tyson, uh, what time is it? I said, well, Mr. Greenwood, I, I'm not really sure. He, he said, Reverend Tyson, I, I don't mean any offense, uh, but I was taught that a man who doesn't wear a watch is a man who doesn't value time. What you do when you get in the room will determine whether the gifted people in the room let you stay in the room because if you come in there shucking and jiving, you're going to mess up their flow. Over 30 years of scientific research has come to this conclusion. Great people are made, not born. Great people are made, not born. No one will ever be greater than Jesus. And the scripture says that Jesus became great. Became great. He said, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. I thought Jesus was omniscient. I thought Jesus was omnipresent. Listen, listen, listen to what the Bible said. Go to Luke chapter 2 and verse number 40. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 40. I want to welcome those of you that have joined us midway in this Tuesday midweek matter Bible study. I'm so glad you're here. And today we are studying from the subject, accepting the responsibility to be great. As you're coming into the class, I'm going to ask you to take a moment to share, to like, comment. Let me know where you're watching from. And also let me know that you're being blessed by this study with the Calvary family. I'm in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 40. Jesus became great. 240 Luke. Read please. And the child grew. And wax strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace God. The word grew in this text is not talking about his physiological growth. It is from the Greek word, oxano. And the word oxano, grew, means to increase, to become greater. So if you were to read this text in the original Greek, it would read on this wise. And the child increased and became greater in spirit and wisdom and the greater grace of God was upon him. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name. Let the class help me say there's still room, there's still room for, more for more growth in me. In me. 
I want you to type that in the comment section. There's still room for more growth in me. I'm going to wrap up here in just a few minutes. Thank you, Lord. Most people would describe Michael Jordan, they're going to get argument from me, but they would describe Jordan as the greatest basketball player of all time. I'd like to make a case for LeBron. But mo mo most basketball enthusiasts and purists would say Jordan was the greatest of all time. What many in the, in the general population do not know was that Michael Jordan was cut by his eighth grade basketball coach. And when I say cut, sisters, that means he didn't even make the team. Jordan said that he decided in that moment he was never again going to experience that sinking feeling of knowing that he had not lived up to his full potential. Jordan said he knew and everybody else on the team knew that he had the most talent. Even though he got cut. They all knew that Jordan had the most natural ability. But there were other boys who made the team ahead of him because they had the will. Jordan said once he made that decision, he said, no one will ever again out-prepare me. For the rest of my life, I'm going to be the most prepared athlete in the game. The path to greatness begins when you understand the secret to perfect performance is perfect practice. The path to greatness begins when you understand the secret to perfect performance is perfect practice. My brother, the late Elder Lawrence Craig Tyson, is widely regarded as the greatest gospel organist who ever lived. He was the template, he was the pattern after which all of the great musicians today have patterned themselves. G. Leron, Matthew Simmons, Corey Henry, all of them. Craig and Uncle Tim, Pastor Timothy Carpenter, were antithetical opposites in their performance style. And that earned them the nickname Fire and Ice. Uncle Tim was fire, Uncle Craig was ice. Those of you that grew up around Calvary in his younger days remember that Pastor Carpenter was always very demonstrative. He rocked back and forth, <laughs> throw his glasses out in the audience. He play a while and he stop and he clap his hand. Then he'd stand up and lift up the lid on the grand piano and play the strings in the piano like it was a guitar. <laughs> Uncle Tim was the hype man. Whereas Craig was just the opposite. He would sit perfectly still. He barely barely budged while he was playing, stoic facial expressions, well, most of the time, until some pretty girl walked around for offering. <laughs> then he came to life, <laughs> smile and wink at him. People would say, Craig is so smooth. Am I right, Sister Kirk? He makes it look so easy. But if you were to ask Pastor Carpenter, or if you were to ask uh, Under Shepherd Gary Bratley, if you were to ask Mr. Wagner, they would verify this, and I, I'll verify it. It drove me crazy. When Craig was learning a song or a difficult scale, 
or a difficult rift, and I'm not exaggerating. He listened to one phrase 25 times. Rewind it. Rewind it again. Rewind it again. Fifty times. Rewind it again. A hundred times. Rewind it again. A hundred fifty times. Rewind it again. I, I, said, I said, great. That, that's, that's it. That's, that's the scale right there. That's it. He, he said, it sounds right to you. But it doesn't sound perfect to me. And I want to say to each of you that God has called to be great, that you can never set your standard of greatness on what greatness sounds like to other people who are willing to be average. Come on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody look at the student near you and tell them, play it again. So how do we do this? And I'm going to get ready to close. Number one, let the class say, follow your passion. Just a little bit today, and I'll talk more about this on Thursday. Thank you, Jesus. There were seven days last week, and I preached seven times. You know you're too tired when you're shaking. That means you need to go sit down. I, I said, well, I know, I know Elder Smith would teach for me today, but I wanted to sh come over here and tell you, you have to be great. <laughs> then I'm going to go, I'm going to get done with this. I'm going to go sit down a while until I get this shake out of me. I had preached so much last week that Sunday night, Sunday night, when I finally went to sleep, because it takes me hours to come down out of the spirit after a high service. Hours. Usually, Elder Bowers would tell you this. When we would be trying to save a, save a church some money, and he said, Pastor Tyson, do you need two rooms? I said, no, we're just overnight. I said, no, we'll just, just get us one room, two double beds. And Elder Bowers would be in there. He'd be one midnight. When you want to sleep? I said, pretty soon. <laughs> one o'clock. Pastor, you sleepy yet? I'm getting there. <laughs> Two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. And I might fall asleep for an hour or two, maybe. Well, Sunday night, I preached so much last week that when I got done preaching, and I finally fell asleep Sunday night. Now it might be about 3 o'clock. When I woke up at 5 for prayer, I was drenching wet like I had just got done preaching in a tent meeting because my brain still thought I was preaching. You must, number one, Follow your passion. Follow your passion. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 51. And I'll get ready to close. Luke 9 and 51. Follow your passion. I'm talking about accepting the responsibility to be great. Luke 9, 51. Follow your passion. What do you love to do? Luke 9, 51. All right, class, reading here at the church and at home. Let's read. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face. You know, when people really get something in their mind that they want to do for God and do for the kingdom and do for people that they love, they'll do it even if it kills them. I got no amen, zero. Zero amens and one, mm-hmm. <laughs> the most 
multitudes followed Jesus, celebrated him, lauded him, applauded them as long as he was giving them bread, fishes, wine, and good time. But then when he said, here, come get this cross. The scripture said they deserted him. He was left with the twelve and they dwindled down till he was just left with John. John was the only one at the cross when Jesus died for it. You see, only gifted people live for it. But great people will die for it. When you are passionate about something, no problem, no adversity, no obstacle, nobody telling you you cannot do it, none of that will dissuade you from reaching that goal. Number two, how do I become great? You must live what you love. Live what you love. Psalm 1 and verse number 2. Psalm 1 verse number 2. Now saints, before you go off of the air, before you leave the class tonight, I want to remind us that this is our midweek worship. And we're worshiping the Lord in our midweek offering today. I'm going to ask everyone, as we always do, that are able to give a $20 free will offering today or as close to it as you can. And if you have not tied within the last pay period, I'm going to ask you to be mindful of the Kingdom 10 on today. Live what you love. Psalm 1, verse number 2. Do you have it, saints? Let's read it together aloud, please. But his delight is in the law of the Lord when does he do it? Day and, Day and night. Carl Yastrzemski, who was the great Boston Red Sox catcher back in the 70s, he said, I wake up thinking about baseball. I go to sleep thinking about baseball. He said, the only time I would come in the house because I played baseball all day long, the only time I would come in is when the street lights would go out and our mother would make us come in the house because I love baseball. When you really love something, it's never really work. It's your passion in performance. It's your passion in performance. I'm going to stop here today with this third path to greatness. Number three, harness, harness, harness the power of people. Harness the power of people. Read one last scripture with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 8. Remember on Sunday we learned that no one becomes great alone. Harness the power of other people. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse number 8. Let's read this together aloud here in the church and at home. We're reading, now he that planted and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. It's nine that I'm really interested in. Verse nine, read, for we are laborers, for we are laborers, how? Together with God, read, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. 
Tell the student that is nearest you, I make a commitment unto you. I make a commitment unto you. With the help of God. With the help of God. I will do. All in my power, in my power. To, help you to help you be great. Be great. If you really mean that, clap your hands and give the Lord a tremendous praise. We're talking about greatness, so we must give him a great praise. Are there any questions before I turn the class over to uh, Elder Smith for prayer and for the benediction. Minister Brantley. Just one, the three principles that you gave us, you titled those the... The path to greatness. The path to greatness. Thank, you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments or insights? Minister Sadie. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Jesus. But uh, I remember when I was young, a bishop standing uh, at the altar and spilling water. Spilling water consumed me, yet the floor was dry. Mm -hmm. And the thought, I just wrote this down while you were teaching. There's a well, there's a well in you. There's a well in you. That must be unleashed that, by you. That must be unleashed by you. By all means. By all means. Yes. Necessary. But, uh, That's power. Based on how many times you do and delay by how many times you do not. Wow. Come, give me that one more time, that whole phrase. There's a well in you. Everyone say that. Let's repeat it after. Do it one more time, Minister Sadie. There is a well in you. There is a well in you. That must be unleashed by you. That must be unleashed by you. By all means necessary. Based on how many times you do. Based on how many times you do. And delay. And delay. By how many times you do not. Wow. Whew. That's power. Thank you for sharing that. I hope you got that at home. Hallelujah. Put that in your top 10 phrases list for 2022. Mama D, did you have your hand up? Right. We need to go back and realize that God was incarnated in Christ and that his body was as human as ours is. Yes. So everything he faced was everything we faced. And if he could face it, he would be left. He says, I gave you a comforter. He gave us the Holy Ghost. And sometimes, it's, no, sometimes we talk about me. We fall short of keeping our mind that God is incarnate Yes. Powerful point. Thank you for sharing it. Any other questions or perspectives that would like to share before we get ready to close for today? How many feel like you got something out of this Bible plan? Come on, Dad. I did. I got two Bible classes. I got Evangelist Brogdon's Bible class. Absolutely. And, and I got that, whatever that was, I just tried to do. You, you got the you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Bless you. Like shoes you got Thank on. you, Jesus. Let's pray for the pastor, y'all, before we leave. Point your hand. Stand on your feet. Point your hand toward the man of God. And we want to give ourselves to the Lord, and we want to give ourselves to him. That's uh, 2 Corinthians uh, verse 8 and uh, chapter 8 and verse 4. We're going to give ourselves to you, 8 and 5. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God, for the man of God. We thank you for this Bible lesson. We ask you, Lord God, to allow the holy angels of Jesus Christ to minister unto him now, Lord God. Touch his body. We speak strength and wisdom and courage into his heart. 
heart. Hallelujah. Mm. Preserve him blameless until the coming of the Lord. Bless and comfort his wife, his son, his wife, his grandchildren, Kate and Sean Tyson and Krista Valerie Tyson. Bless the Tyson, Dawkins, Wallace, Wagner family. Thank you. These are leaders in Jesus' name. Now go with us all. Preserve us blameless and keep us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you, man, Pastor. Tell them join us tomorrow at 5 a.m. for morning prayer. Yes, tomorrow, 5 a.m., Sister Tyson will be on the line. Bless you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.